I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and let's talk about intergenerational national trauma instilled by mass starvation. The subject of this Irish folklore video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. You can help vote to decide what kind of content I make by signing up for as little as $1 a month. This was originally going to be a video specifically about On Fargarta, the Hungry Man, and On Fairgarta, the Hungry Grass. And while I was able to find a great deal of sources on both, those sources were rather limited in their scope and they all more or less said the same thing so it didn't feel like i could make an expansive video on just that topic alone now both of these things are representations of the supernatural starvation motif which is something that has always been present in irish folklore it felt strange doing this without including one of the other main representations of this motif, the Alp Luachra. As it happens, the stories of these three things, while they were a present thing anyway in Irish folklore, became much more popular in the mid-1800s. And I feel that talking about this subject without having a broader discussion as to why that was would be disingenuous part one on far goethe when a person is going on a long journey they put a piece of oaten bread in their pocket, afraid they would meet the far Goethe, the hunger man. That was supposed to just be a fun introductory quote to discussing on far Goethe. However, there is very little more information than that. The far Goethe is a spirit of hunger that wanders the roads looking like a person completely emaciated by starvation they will beg for food if you do not provide them with food you will be struck with terrible starvation yourself that can only be cured by eating immediately otherwise you will starve to death now, W.B. Yeats offers a little bit more. He says that if you give the Fardegarta food, it will bless you with good luck. However, I have not been able to find any supporting material for this claim. And we all know how I feel about Yeats. Part 2 Unfair, Goethe. A cyclist who had eaten recently was overcome by the hungry grass. He dismounted and pushed his bike as best he could till he came to a dwelling. The woman there who gave him food said that hungry grass was common in that spot. Another man out hunting, was compelled to consume the raw flesh of a recently shot hare. If he had not eaten it, he was sure he would have died. Upon arriving home, he ate copiously without feeling satisfied. The fair garter, or hungry grass, comes up a lot more often. But curiously, it is never really mentioned by Yeats, perhaps because it is far more difficult to manipulate to fit into the ideas of romantic literature. The fair Goethe, 
is what I like to refer to as a supernatural disaster. It is a patch of grass where, if you step upon it, you will be immediately claimed by insatiable, fatal hunger. And the only way to save yourself is to immediately eat, just like with the Fargart. Many people would not leave their homes without having some form of food about them to stave off the Fergart. Oat cakes were often used for this. Oh, some people would also carry a little bag of grain in their pocket, just in case. If you were caught without, however, you could chew upon a leather shoelace and swallow the juice that this produced. And this would at least keep you alive until you were able to get to a place where there was food. The Fergarta was treated as if it were a fairly normal everyday thing. People wouldn't leave the house without taking some kind of precaution against it, just as many people wouldn't leave the house without bringing a jacket in case it rained. And if you look through the Ducas archive, you can see dozens of accounts that explain exact locations for where the Fergarta could be found and where to avoid. It was considered a normal piece of the geography, a normal hazard of travelling akin to potholes or bad weather. The term on Fergarta could also refer to the feeling of intense hunger that people would get from stepping upon that patch of grass, or sometimes just for hunger in general. People would say, a Fergarta is upon me or that they had taken the Fergarta. There are several explanations for where the Fergarta came from. If a meal partaken out of doors, and one without giving thanks, and two without leaving a morsel of food for the fairies, the Fergarta would be in that place. Fergarta results from laying down a corpse. It is the name given to the terrible hunger which often strikes people when going on a journey if they step on the Fujian Marav. Now we're going to talk a little about those last two because they're actually very interesting. I wasn't familiar with the term Fujian Marav before researching this video. It means the dead sod. But when I looked it up outside of the Dukas archive, what I found wasn't Fujin Malav, but Fujin Myarvil, which means the bewildering sod, or stray sod. Now the stray sod is something I'm familiar with. It's a patch of grass where, when you step on it, something happens to confuse and disorient you. You could be trapped in the place you are in. You could be blinded to any way of escaping. Or you could just be spun around in circles, like when you step on that one tile in a Team Rocket base. But what's interesting is where the Fujin Marvel is supposed to have come from. It's supposed to be a place where someone has laid down a coffin. And with that context, the term Fujin Maru, which appears far more often in the Dukas archive and means dead sod, makes more sense than stray or bewildering sod. So I'm just going to put it out there with minimal research, I will add that perhaps the term stray sod is inaccurate. Perhaps the term dead sod was the one that was actually in use. Anyway, that's something of a tangent. Let's get back to the point. After a certain point, a new explanation developed 
for the fair garter. A traveller is supposed to take the fair garter at a spot where a person or persons died of the famine. Now the development of that explanation is actually very important. We'll talk about that more later. Part 3. The Alp Lugre. Imagine it is a hot, humid summer's day. You are out working in the fields and you're overcome with exhaustion because of the heat and the work and decide to have a nice lie down, perhaps in some slightly damp grass or by a river or stream. You wake up several hours later and you are starving. You feel like you'll die if you don't eat. But no matter how much you eat, the hunger never abates. In fact, it feels like it's getting worse. And as time goes on, you waste away and you wither and you suffer. You can feel something moving inside you, something wriggling and slithering. And eventually, the starvation kills you. You have been a victim of the Alp Lugre. The word Alp Lugre is commonly translated as just haver or joint eater. But it refers to newts or lizards. Alp Lugre are most commonly referenced as a source of cures. It is said that if you lick an Alp Lugre, you will be able to cure burns from then on. However, there are some stories where the Alp Lugre is a creature of the other world. Sometimes it is seen as a denizen of the other world, one of its indigenous creatures. Sometimes it is seen as a fairy taking on the form of a newt or a lizard. Now it lurks in streams and damp grass. It slips itself into the mouth of someone who is sleeping nearby. It enters their stomach and there it feeds upon the contents of the stomach. And it stays there and it grows and it breathes. And the victim wastes away, becoming thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker. And no matter how much they eat, they never stop starving. And the Alp Lucre, as it grows and it breeds, the pain in the gut becomes worse and worse. And if the creature is not removed and its brood along with it, the host will die. Fortunately, treatment for an Alp Lugre infestation is quite simple. One needs only to consume a vast quantities of salted meat, but never take a drink. The more and more of this they eat, the more and more of that salt the Alp Lugre themselves consume, the more thirsty they become. The victim then lays themselves down by a stream or a river, and waits for the creatures to emerge through the mouth to look for a drink to keep themselves alive. Part 4. Meat and Potatoes As I said at the beginning of the video, stories of supernatural starvation have always existed in Irish folklore before becoming more popular in the 1800s. They may have begun as an attempt to explain things like heat stroke or low blood sugar. Diabetics certainly existed then just as they do today and it could also have been an attempt to explain other nutritional deficiencies such as hyponatremia. But there's more, isn't there? You may think I haven't noticed 
the specter looming over my shoulder. How it seems to become more vivid and corporeal the more I talk about a certain subject. The more I talk about Angartha Moore, the great that. As I keep saying, stories of supernatural starvation, they became more popular in Ireland in the mid-1800s, specifically the mid-1840s. Because in 1845, the potato blight struck Ireland. So this spectre behind me is not just a product of Irish folklore, but of British folklore as well. Normally, folklore is generated organically. People tell each other stories, they come up with explanations. Something resonates and it spreads. But sometimes, folk belief is deliberately generated and cultivated. I've already given an example of this with my Dollisher video. And the folk belief that was generated around Ungartha Moor, around the Great Famine, was that it was unavoidable, and that there was nothing anyone could have done to prevent it. This was generated by the British government of the time, and has been maintained and cultivated down through the centuries since. You see, the Irish were not dependent solely upon potatoes because they had a particular taste for them. Nearly all of the farmland in Ireland belonged to British colonisers. The people of Ireland themselves had very, very little land upon which to grow food for themselves. And potatoes, they were cheap. And you could grow a great many of them in a very small space. So they became a staple food for the Irish people. Oh, Irish labourers and farmhands, they would work very hard upon farms owned by the British. They would be cultivating grains and crops and animals of all kinds, producing huge amounts of food. All for the British. And all of this food would be exported. Now, during the famine, that export did not cease, nor did it slow. The people could not hunt legally, because legally all of the game of Ireland belonged to the British Crown. The people could not fish legally, because legally all fish belonged to to the British crown. The attitude of the British Empire in regard to the mass starvation in Ireland during Angarta Moor could be summed up by Lord Charles Trevelyan. He was an assistant to Her Majesty's Treasury and was largely in charge of the relief effort in Ireland. with which we must contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but rather the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. Hmm. The Irish famine is the judgment of God and an effective mechanism for reducing the surplus population. And so, even though Ireland was producing more than enough food to feed everyone, it was decided when the potato blight struck that it was more important to protect the economy of the British Empire and the people of Ireland. 
And so the population of Ireland was halved and 200 years later, it has not recovered. Regardless of the intention, the decision to protect the economy over the lives of millions had the effect of genocide. And I do have to say that the decision of many governments today in regard to the coronavirus, a virus that disproportionately affects the poor, the disabled and black and brown people throughout the world, to protect the economy over the lives of millions, regardless of the intent of this decision, has the effect of genocide. After the horrors of Ungurta Moor, the sights and sounds it would have inflicted upon the people of Ireland, that they would have passed down to their children and their grandchildren, it is reasonable that stories of supernatural starvation became far more popular in the years after. They would have seemed more relatable, more visceral, more vivid and real than they would have done before the blight struck. Thank you for watching this video on supernatural starvation in Irish folklore. Thank you also for putting up with my post-colonial rage and for your patience. This video took an awful long time to make. I have been wrestling with After Effects for about two weeks, almost non-stop. Even when I thought it was finished and I had won and I had defeated After Effects, I was wrong. Also a special thank you to the Great Ashcarp, first of her name, Keeper of the Magikarp and Empress of the Great Shiny Sea, Queequeg, and all of my other patrons, many of whose names are scrolling across the screen as I witter on. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by leaving a like, leaving a comment, sharing the videos around, showing them to people you like, showing them to your enemies, just, just, just moving it all over the place. That's very helpful. If you want to support in a more concrete way, we do have merch. You can find links to that in the video description. Or there is a Ko-fi and there is Patreon as well. But the liking, sharing, subscribing, all of that is extremely helpful. And do remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.